All righty, come on in and find yourself a place to park, and uh, we'll get started with the service tonight. Take your Bible this evening to 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We begin this evening with verse number 15 where the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture this evening. Lord, I pray that as we bow before you and we open up this book, that thy Holy Spirit would teach us your word tonight. Help us do exactly what this verse says. Help us to study and help us to show ourselves approved unto God. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth this evening. And so, Lord... I pray you administer to each of us as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, you got those papers ready? I want you to pass these papers out. This little additional information I wanted you to have tonight as we start this uh, passage in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. We ended last week, I think the first thing on your paper there, we ended last week about not to strive about words to no profit, that, but that there were the only that only ended up being to the subverting of the hearers or the overthrowing uh, of the hearers. And the way we do that is found in verse number 15. And that is, study to show thyself approved unto God. You're, you get those out? If you have a King James Bible with you tonight, I want you to know that that's the only English Bible that has the word study in it. That's why I wanted you to see these other translations that have come out. ASV stands for the American Standard Version, which is give diligence to present thyself approved unto God. The ERV, I think that's the easy reader version, is what that stands for. The English, it's, it's something to be easy reading. Do your best to be the kind of person God will accept and give yourself to Him. The ESV, which is a very popular version of the Bible these days, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. The Living Bible says, work hard so God can say to you, well done. The New American Standard Bible, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. The NIV says, do your best to present yourself to God has one approved. Isn't it interesting that no, there's no command in any of the other English Bibles to study the Word of God? No command to study God's Word. Study means to literally, it's a setting of the mind or thoughts upon a subject. Hence, the application of mind of books, arts to science, or to any subject for the purpose of learning what is not before known. It, it, in, in simple language, it's to examine closely in order to learn thoroughly. I'm to examine the Word of God closely so as to learn it thoroughly. So we have to study the Word of God. Now what does that involve? Well, it involves several things when it comes to studying the Word of God. Number one, we are to read the Scriptures. We are to read the Scriptures. Now, turn in the Bible with me, will you? Get your, get your fingers limbered up here. We'll look at some Scriptures, alright? Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy 17, and then with your other finger, hold a finger in the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. 
All right? Book of Revelation chapter 1. Just get that ready to go right after we read this verse in Deuteronomy. All right? Are you in Deuteronomy? Okay, Deuteronomy 17. Here's the instruction. The instruction is God is giving Israel instruction for the day whenever they'll have a king. What should the king do? Notice what he said. Verse 18. It shall be, Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of the which is before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. God says, when you're king, here's a requirement I have for the king. He's got to read the law of God every day, all the days of his life. So what's that have to do with you and me? Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Do you have that? The Bible says, John, verse number 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you in peace from Him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, and hath made us, what's the word church? Who did He make kings? Uh, you and me. He made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So now we find out God. if God wanted the King of Israel to read His Word every day, and then He's made us kings and priests unto Him, do you think He expects us to read His Word every day? It would make sense to me. And so as we read the Bible, George Mueller was known for his strong faith, and he confided, the first three years after my conversion, I neglected the Word of God. Since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. I have read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, said this, Read the Bible and read it again and do not despair to help of help to understand something of the will and mind of God, though you think they are fast locked up from you. Neither trouble yourself, though ye may not have commentaries and expositions. Pray and read and read and pray. A little from God is better than a great deal from man. You know, as you read and you read, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And often when you read this passage and you're not quite sure what it means, keep reading. And, and God will illuminate you. God will give you insight later about what you read earlier. But you have to continue to read. And sometimes it, you'll find that if you read the Bible through or you read passages through, for years now, I've read Proverbs every day, and uh, well over 30 years, and yet there's still things I'll find in Proverbs that I never saw before. Now how does that happen? Uh, hundreds of times. Because that's God's Word, that's why. And it's, it, you, you'll never get to the depth of it. You'll never be able to uh, exhaust its pages. So read the Bible. Then number two, believe the Bible. Believe the Bible. Let's pick up Psalm 119 and then Hebrews chapter 4. The 119th Psalm and then Hebrews chapter 4. In Psalm 119, notice with me verse 160. It's interesting, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, and it's chapter devoted completely to the Word of God. 
And in verse number 160, the Bible says this, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Sounds to me like he believed the Bible. He believed the Scriptures. When you read God's Word, what are you reading? I had to uh, remind the, the guys last week in the prison that when you read the Bible, you don't read it like you're reading anything else. I can, I can read a newspaper article or read a magazine article or uh, read something online and you know, you just kind of, you, you, you can get through pretty quickly because you're kind of just picking out the highlights. But you don't read God's Word that way. You read God's Word slowly and deliberately. Why? It's God's truth. These are not just the concepts of God. These are the words of God. And I want to believe these are the words of God. Notice what he said in Hebrews 4. In Hebrews 4, he said this in verse number 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Well, why didn't it profit them? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to, when you hear the Word of God, when you read the Word of God, you have to have faith to believe this is God's Word. And it's not something you take flippantly. It's not something you just take uh, like you would the, the, the newspaper. This is the Word of God. And I believe it to be the Word of God. The authority of the Bible doesn't come from the caliber of the human authors. The authority of the Word of God comes from the character of its divine author. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What an honor, what a privilege. We, we talked with uh, Pastor Amos today, who Brother Yoder just returned from Uganda, and he just was mentioning how not only does, do, do many of the church members there not have a Bible, some of the pastors don't have a Bible. How do you minister? How do you, how do you grow in your Christian life? The Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you can grow thereby. How would you grow if you didn't have God's Word? God has given us His book. We're honored to have it. And so we have to believe that it's the Scriptures and believe that it's God's words. So we read the Scripture, we believe the Scripture. Number three, we meditate on the Scripture. Now for that, go back to Psalm 119 again. And of course, I think we're familiar with Psalm 1, are we not? Psalm 1, uh, um, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate. How often? Day and night. The rest of the time is yours. You just meditate in God's Word day and night. All right. Now, Psalm 119 he says this in verse number 5. He says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. I want, I want my ways to be directed. In how, and the way that happens is you have to meditate in God's Word. To meditate, the Bible's full of passages about meditation, by the way. Uh, in the Old Testament alone, there's 58 references to meditation on God's Word. And again, meditation isn't you getting quiet and humming and putting your fingers and your thumb together, okay? That's not biblical meditation. It is a meditation refers to a listening to God's Word, a reflection of God's work, a rehearsing of God's deeds. And those lead to obedience to God. And that's always essential and goes hand in hand with biblical meditation. It's internalizing and personalizing the passage you read. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Bob and these other guys heard me say that so many times at the prison. And I always tell them, I said, listen, put your name in there. But God commended His love toward Stan in that while Stan was yet a sinner, Christ died for Stan. God commended His love toward Brett in that while Brett was yet a sinner, Christ died for Brett. You see, you've got, to put, you've got to personalize it. That's for me. That's where the blessing comes in. But you do that, you do that all through the Scripture. Make that Scripture yours. 
and go over it and over it and over it and internalize it and personalize it. That's meditation. Where you continue to think on it and dwell on it and you become saturated with the Word of God. And all of a sudden, listen, it's not a Sunday school lesson you're preparing. It's not a devotional you're reading. And it's not just the thoughts of somebody else. It's, it's words addressed to you to help you in your life. Because God wrote the book for you. God wrote the book for me. It's personal. And so we need to meditate on the Scripture. He told Joshua, you're going to meditate day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to what is written therein. All that is written therein. You're never going to do according to all that's written therein if you don't think about it. If you don't meditate on it. Thinking determines living. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And, and are you, Brother Currington always says, before you ever did it, you thunk it. And we do. And so if I'm going to do right and I want to do what God wants, I have to think the way God wants me to think. Then I'll do what God wants me to do. So we have to meditate on the Scripture. We're reading the Scripture, believing the Scripture, meditating on the Bible. Number four, praying to understand the Bible. Again, in Psalm 119, if you're still there, Verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 18. Here's a great prayer. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's a good prayer to pray before you read your Bible. Lord, open my eyes, that I could behold wondrous things out of thy word today. Pray. Ask him. 30, uh, verse 34. David prays, Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. But I need understanding. Now with that in mind, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, will you please? Let's look at something in the New Testament, which a passage that is often misunderstood. 1 Corinthians 2. Look with me at verse number 9, will you? Are you there? Amen? Amen? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Now, oftentimes you hear that verse read and somebody says, you can't imagine how wonderful heaven's going to be. And they use that verse to talk about heaven. But that's not what that verse is talking about. Now I agree, heaven's going to be marvelous, going to be exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. None of us can fathom what that's going to be like or what that's going to look like, but I didn't want that's talking about. And uh, I, I had to laugh the other day. I had a little, saw a little comic thing. It was two very old ladies rocking in a rocking chair on a porch. And the one said to the other, I'm getting so old, my friends up in heaven are going to think I didn't make it. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I thought, I'm going to go up and see my mom tomorrow. She's going to be 92 in a few days. And uh, I thought I'd show that to her and see what she thinks. But uh, that's not talking about heaven, okay? That's not what that deals with, okay? Because notice what it says. Now, I have not seen nor heard neither in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his Spirit. Where does the Spirit of God dwell? In you and in me. He's inside of us. So He reveals them to us. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So you can't ever use the excuse, I just can't understand the Bible. Why? The author is living inside of you. Have you asked Him for understanding? Have you asked Him to help you grasp the truth that you're reading? Most Christians read the Bible and try to, try to understand the Bible and never do ask for help. The Holy Spirit is the one called alongside to help. And so ask and pray for understanding. Ask Him to open your eyes and to open your heart to the Word of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. 
which, all, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man, the natural man is the unsaved man. What's it say about him? He receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? The Spirit of God doesn't live in him. He only dwells in the believer. So he doesn't understand the things of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. They're spiritually disconnected. That which the Holy Spirit of God ministers to our spirit, the things are the things of God. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And it's the Spirit of God that guides us into all truth. So as you read the Bible and you, and you um, meditate in the Bible and you believe the Bible, then you have to pray to understand the Bible. Take time to ask the Spirit of God to help you. The, the, listen, don't as soon as you get to a tough passage, don't, don't go run into the, someone else in the church. Don't go run into someone else and say, hey, what does this mean? Uh, pray about it first. I'm not opposed to getting help or getting advice. But listen, don't, don't lean on that. The Bible never said the pastor will lead you into all truth. I certainly will, but no. But uh, you, it doesn't say that. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. He's the one you need to learn to rely on and look to and, and count that He will teach you the Word of God. And He will. And then number five, delight in the Bible. Delight in the Bible. Psalm 1-2, His delight is in the law of the Lord. Also, Psalm 119 again, and while you're over in the New Testament, just put a finger in Romans, will you? And uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're going to go to Psalm 119 first, and then we'll look back at Romans 7. Psalm 119 again, about delighting in the law of the Lord. Here's the psalmist again. Now there's numerous scriptures. Verse 16, Psalm 119 verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 24. Thy testimonies also are my what church? My what? My delight and my counselors. Verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Verse 47. And I will... Delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Verse 70, Psalm 119. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Verse 77. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Yeah, when you delight in something, you look forward to it. You enjoy it. If you delight in... If somebody says, man, I delight in Ohio State football. Oh, that's great. Have you ever been to a game? No. Well, how about that game last Saturday? Did you watch it? No. Well, what about the one when they played Penn State? And up winning? No, I didn't see that one either. You'd have a hard time convincing me that you delight in the Ohio State Buckeyes. Because you don't spend any time watching the games. You don't even know who the players are. You don't know anything about them. Well, when you delight in something, you want to spend time with that that you delight in. You want to invest in that you delight in. Now look what Paul said in Romans 7. Romans 7. The only time, by the way, the word delight is used in the New Testament. Romans 7, verse number 22. Paul said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, the inward man, our inner man delights in the Word of God. The flesh does not. The soul oftentimes does not. What I think, what I feel, what I want. You uh, alarm goes off in the morning or you wake up in the morning, right away the flesh says, roll over. Hit the button. You know? And, and yet you know, in the inner man, he's saying, 
It's time to read God's Word. And, and you know that's what God would want you to do. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. And the inner man delights in the law of the Lord. So we delight in Scripture. Now, if you summed all those up, reading the Bible and meditating the Bible and believing the Bible and, and praying to understand the Scripture and delighting in the Scripture, you know what it all comes down to? One word. Study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And that's why we study. To be approved unto God. Not approved by college. Not approved by man. Not approved by scholars. Not to boast of our Bible knowledge to other people. But to be approved unto God. The word approved means to be commended. To be shown or proved to be worthy of approbation. I had to look up approbation to make sure I knew what that meant. Approbation, it simply means to bring pleasure or satisfaction to someone. It's a liking. God is saying we can study to show ourselves worthy of God liking us, approving of us, being satisfied with us. It's exactly what He's saying. Let me, if I dissected and defined it and put this verse in, in those words, it would be this. Set your mind upon the Word of God for the purpose of learning thoroughly that you may be proved worthy of the liking, pleasure, and support of God. You see, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, Whoso turneth his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. All God is saying is, if you turn your ear away from listening to me, I'm not listening to you. You see, you forfeit the support of God. Why would God help you when you're neglecting His Word? Why would God help you when you're neglecting the help He's given you? Which is His Word. We tell folks a lot of times, what are you? And they say, well, you pray for me. I'm struggling with this or struggling with that. Listen, no amount of my prayers will make up for your disobedience to God's Word. That's why the very first principle you learn in RU is if God is against it, so am I. In other words, if God says this is wrong, it's wrong. And I have to agree with God about that. No amount of someone praying for you, dis you disobeying what you know God's Word says is, isn't going to change anything. My prayer won't change your disobedience. Obey. Obey. Then you get, when you study and to show yourself approved to God, you get the support of God. He's there for you. So studying the Word of God pleases the Lord. Now notice what else it says. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You alright? Everybody okay? Haven't lost you yet? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. There's our second word we're going to look at. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There's two types of workmen. Number one is a laborer. A laborer is someone who's got to sweat, toil, physical exertion. Work done or work to be done that requires some physical exertion where it's going to involve some weariness. Physical labor. He's a laborer. But then there's another kind of workman that is what's called a craftsman. He is a skilled tradesman. We labor in the Word in order to become craftsmen of the Word. So we need not be ashamed. You don't automatically become a skilled tradesman in the Bible. Everybody starts out as a laborer. And you have to put in some exertion. You have to put in some work. You have to study. You have to... Uh, Put some toil.
toil and some sweat into it. Proverbs again mentions how often God talks about searching for truth like men search for treasure. If you ever ever saw any of these programs on television where they're uh, looking for you know sunken ships that have treasure and such, man, these guys are serious about this stuff. And I mean, they work and they sweat and they spend money. And they're, 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 they're doing all they can to find this treasure. And most Christians very rarely ever apply themselves to be workmen, laborers in the Word of God. Laborers so they can eventually become craftsmen, skilled tradesmen in the Word of God. Why do we want to do that? So we won't be ashamed before God. Notice, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed means you're affected by shame, you're abashed, you're abashed or confused by guilt or conviction of some criminal action or improper conduct or by the exposure of some gross errors or misconduct and it tends to impair your honor and reputation. Imagine, and him before God, and he, he brings up something from the Bible and you kind of stare blankly at him. What? Where, where was that found again? Well, Lord, you know, I never read those pages too much. They kind of stick together in my Bible, you know. I wonder how embarrassing, how ashamed some of us will be at our lack of knowledge of God's Word. Don't, don't say there's no time. We all have the same amount of time in the week. And you know, time to do what we really want to do. And what we don't really want to do, we find an excuse. So we study to show ourselves approved unto God. I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before Him. I don't want to be ashamed. He says, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Now, if, it's, we can, if we can rightly, if He tells us to rightly divide the Word, does that, do I understand it right then? We can wrongly divide the Word? <laughs> and there are people who wrongly divide the Word. Say, so what do you mean? Well, let me make sure we understand. The rapture, the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds and we rise to meet the Lord in the air, that is not the second coming of Jesus. That comes seven years later when He comes to earth for the second time. There's a difference. You have to rightly divide the Word of truth. We are, we are not... Um, we, we, the church, we, we mentioned this the other day, we're in the church age. The church is not Israel. There are those who teach that, well, Israel set aside and now the church has become Israel. No, we're not. Israel's Israel. We're the church. And, and, and they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same thing. They're different. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Now I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You doing all right? Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice verse number 17 with me. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we, in Christ. Now once again, I call your attention to that paper I gave to you. This is the second verse on your paper. Again, here's the other modern English versions and how they quote that verse. Or how they have written that verse in their versions. Notice the King James says, We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. For we are not ESV, we are not like so many peddlers of God's Word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. 
New American Standard Bible, we are not like many peddling the Word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. By the way, the New King James. Lest you think, well, they just revised the King James. No, they didn't. They went back and took the manuscripts that all the other English translations came from, which are the faulty manuscripts, and they translated a New King James and put a New King James label on it, but it's not a New King James. Notice what it says. For we are not has so many peddling the Word of God. But as of sincerity, as from God, we speak the sight of God in Christ. The Living Bible, only those who, like ourselves, are men of integrity, sent by God, speaking with God's power, with God's eye on us. We are not like those hucksters, and there are many of them whose idea in getting out the gospel is to make a good living out of it. And of course, the NIV, unlike so many, we do not peddle the Word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Not a one of them will say, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. You say, why would they avoid that? Because they corrupt the Word of God. That's why they avoid it. And they don't want to say that. And, and it's interesting to me when they say we're not as many who peddle the Word of God, but that's exactly what they're doing. They are in it for money. That's why, that's why every publisher has a different version of the Bible. And they're all copyrighted because it's a money-making deal. Still the best seller in all the world is the Bible. And so they all make money. That's why they all have their own. And so, so the idea is, the, the, let's look at that word corrupt, all right? Corrupt means to change from a sound to a putrid state. To separate the component parts of a body as by a natural process which is accompanied by a fitted smell. To vitiate or deprave, to change from good to bad. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Evil communications corrupt good manners. God is simply saying, evil, evil associations is a word we would use in our, in our time. It's the same as communication. And He says, you know what that will do? That will corrupt good manners. You hang around the wrong people and soon you'll be just like them. You'll become like the people you spend time with. It will corrupt you. In Exodus 32.7, it talks about defiling or polluting using the word corrupt. In 2 Corinthians 11, it talks about enticing from good and alluring someone to evil. Corrupt. You can, you can corrupt a judge. You can bribe a judge. It, it means to render impure. Like you can corrupt a language. Here's another definition of corrupt. It means to pervert, to falsify, to infect with errors. As to corrupt the sacred text. That was in Webster's 1828 dictionary. To infect with errors has to corrupt the sacred text. No wonder they don't want to put corrupt in there. So, aren't you glad you have a Bible? Aren't you glad you have a Bible that God has preserved and kept for us? Now let's go to the third word I want to, us to focus on. And this, is, this will be the last one tonight. Shun. Shun. Verse number 16. 2 Timothy 2 verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. I could, I could take that verse and just empty out most charismatic churches. Just thought I'd throw that in there for you. One who studies as a workman and is a laborer and a craftsman in the Word of God, will shun profane and vain babblings. Why? Because they'll just increase into more ungodliness. Shun means to avoid, to keep clear of, not to fall on or come in contact with, to avoid, to not mix or associate with. The old time... Uh, uh, the Amish community sometimes when someone would do something wrong they would have a shunning it wouldn't have anything to do with that person don't, don't associate with them that's what he's saying we practice here 
with talk or teaching that will lead to ungodliness or error. Here he calls them profane and vain babblings. Profane, of course, means irreverent. It's a contempt for sacred things. It's polluted. It's not pure. Nothing is profane that serves holy things. Profane is common. It's okay for common use. It's not right for God's use. The things of God were holy, set apart, sanctified for Him, as we are to be. Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Then babblings, talking idly, telling secrets. In 1 Timothy 6, it's foolish talk. Why do we avoid those things? It just increases unto more ungodliness. But if I'm laboring in the Word, and I'm desiring to become a craftsman of the Word of God, skilled in the Word of God, and I'm studying to show myself approved unto God, I will be increasing unto more godliness, not ungodliness. Because notice what he says. Those profane and vain babblings, in verse 17, their word will eat as doth a canker. A canker is a, is a kind of a, a virulent, corroding ulcer. It's anything that corrodes or corrupts or destroys it's like cancer. It'll eat you up. Now he gives two names to these guys. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus? I'm sure these guys thought that they're never going to get written in the Bible, and we'd be talking about them 2,000 years later. But here they are. And they were teaching that the resurrection is past already. And that overthrew the faith of some. Now they overthrew the faith of some because they didn't know God's Word. They said, Timothy, you're going to have people that are going to come on the scene and they're going to teach things that just aren't true. How are you going to know? Do you have to study all the false teaching? Do you have to study all the false doctrine? No. You have to study to show yourself approved unto God. You know the truth and you'll detect the error when you hear it. I think they still do it. They used to always, the tellers in the bank and such, they didn't have you handle counterfeit money. They had you handle the real money. You had to feel and to, to know the texture and the feel of that real money so that if ever there was a counterfeit bill coming in your hand, you knew it. You right away knew the feel. Something's not right here. And when you know God's Word and you know God's truth, you'll know error when you come across it. You'll detect it immediately. The one, notice it says, they overthrow the faith of some. I believe the sum are those who never studied to show themselves approved unto God. I've, I've, I've been around a while. Thanks for not saying amen. You know, I, I, I grew up in the church, and, and I was telling somebody today, in, in Camp Baptist Temple, in the, in the days that we were there, it was, it was a normal Sunday to have 4,000 people in attendance. And, and 2,000, 2,000 or so Sunday evenings. And it's a strong church. On, on holidays, Christmas and Easter, it would be 5,500, 5, It was a big church. And, and as, as the, the pastor retired and then he passed away and other things happened throughout the church, that church struggles to get 800 people now. But what grieved me was when people left that church and they went and joined the first Christian church. That believes, if you're not familiar with that, the first Christian church are what they call the disciples of Christ, and they believe you have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. That salvation is faith in Jesus Christ and being baptized. 
Well, how, how can you join that church? That's not what the Bible teaches. If you, ever, if you ever have to leave Bible Baptist Church, at least go join a Bible-believing Baptist church. So, so that you know the Bible somewhat. That you're not going to go off and join some group that doesn't even follow the Scripture. You understand? Don't, don't, don't go somewhere where you know they're not teaching what the Bible says. Study the Word of God. So you'll not be ashamed. You'll be approved unto God. Now, though the faith of some is overthrown, verse 18, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Isn't that good news? Oh, people drop off? Yeah. People fall by the wayside? Yeah. People get blown about? Yeah. But the foundation's still sure. And we're going to talk about that next Wednesday night. Okay? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You, Lord, for people who come to church when the only attraction is to study Your Word together. And we're thankful that we have Your Word tonight. Your words that You have preserved for us. And Lord, I pray that we would not just defend the Bible and carry the Bible. We would study to show ourselves approved unto God. That, Lord, we would make the Word of God our delight. As Job said, we would esteem it more than our necessary food. That we would truly delight in the law of God and meditate in it day and night. Forgive us for our lack of study to show ourselves approved unto our God. Help us to be workmen that need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, again, thank you for each one that's made their way to church tonight. I pray that we leave a little different than when we walked in this evening. I pray that you'll make us mindful that you're with us throughout this week. And Lord, make us men and women of the Bible. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.